So I haven't shot a video for this channel in a long time, and you know, honestly, like when I when I did start producing content for it again, um, uh, you know, I said flat out I wasn't really trying to become YouTube famous, and you know, this this channel is really just a, a pressure relief valve for me, as somebody who runs a martial arts business and is deeply obsessed with martial arts and fitness. Um, it's very easy to kind of get on the train tracks and just go, um, but that's not necessarily the healthiest thing. Right? It's, it's, it's kind of easy to become overly obsessive about the one thing and kind of put everything else on hold, especially when you're draining your energy doing that, you know, wearing yourself out with training and research and study, uh, you know, to the point where you're falling asleep on the couch every day. There's not a lot of energy. I mean, even if we're talking time is available, energy is not always available for other things. Um, so that being the case, right, this channel was never meant to be anything but kind of a pressure relief valve for me. And uh, despite that, right, this video is not about any of the philosophical or artistic topics that, that I intended. This video is really more of a vlog, uh, just for the fact that, that I just need to say some things out loud. I mean, I, I've talked about this stuff with my wife because she's my wife and she needs to know what's going on in here. But I feel like I'm not done saying things. And I didn't want to put this on my main channel um, because the, the support from the community around me has uh, already been tremendous. I mean, some people have helped uh, in, in ways that they have no idea how meaningful it is. And um, it is, it's, it's overwhelming, it, it really is. So let me kind of start at the beginning. And uh, well, okay, so without rambling too much, 2020 was a shitty year for everybody, right? I mean, like uh, globally. It, 2020 was a shitty year for pretty much everybody and the entire problem with being in the martial arts business being in fitness and stuff with all the lockdowns and everything that happened uh, you know my kind of business was the first business to get hit and you know that sucked and luckily the you know, being a business owner, it has gotten me in the habit of saving money, but the thing is that savings only last so long. And I actually lost a lot of students in the lockdowns. Uh, we were down to four students at one point, which was, that's not anywhere remotely enough to keep the lights on, like not remotely enough. And my savings dwindled just trying to keep the business afloat. And that, like that hurt, that hurt a lot. And then to, to, to top that off, you know, despite applying, didn't get any of the grants or loans, uh, didn't get unemployment. Uh, so I got, I got zero aid, uh, despite being a taxpayer. And of course, being who I am, I'm already extremely begrudging of the taxpaying side of it. And then to not get anything back for what gets paid in, that's even more aggravating. But then, you know, we were finally coming out of it, right? We, we were finally coming out of it. We were building back up. We were getting to the point where the student body was built up again. We were breaking even again, um, you know, and literally my wrestling coach came down to teach a special class for us. And two days later, um, you know, this was about two months ago, two days later, somebody set our dumpster on fire. And to our knowledge, you know, it, it, it was just somebody fucking around and lighting things on fire. Um, it doesn't seem like it was a targeted action at all, anything like that. And because the majority of the damage was structural and uh, the damage to our unit, because the majority of the fire damage was on the unit next to ours, um, we thought we were going to be able to salvage the space just limp along for a while, let them do some patchwork repairs and get back to it. So we opened with kind of a limited scheduling and everything for about, you know, close to a month. And then the landlord let us know 
hey, we need to start doing demolition. The insurance wants us to absolutely gut the place. Okay, come on. So we were like, all right, we have to close for a couple of weeks. Well, that didn't work out either. So not only did they say, hey, we're going to have to close for two weeks, but the work crews were working maybe part-time, and uh, we found beer cans uh, in there, like they were drinking on the job. Not, not, not the greatest of, of all things. So they're, they're working part-time, they're not being professional. Um, and then because the entrances uh, were compromised because of the fire department and they never got fixed, um, somebody actually broke in the back door and stole a bunch of my equipment. I mean, it's like going through the final tally, it was something like $1,500 worth of equipment. I actually lowballed it um, when I initially reported, but yeah, we lost about uh, $1,500 worth of uh, weight plates, kettlebells, things like that. And, um, you know, we made a police report, but honestly, the police are useless. And, um, you know, it, it's just like one thing after another. And, and, and the, the fact is that uh, when we last talked to the property manager, not the landlord directly, but his property manager, um, they said that like every piece of lumber that has the tiniest little bit of, of, uh, of, of blackening on it from the fire has to come out. And, and I totally understand that, uh, both from an insurance perspective and from uh, just a construction perspective. You don't want anything that has been compromised in the slightest, um, you know, professionally for liability, uh, all that kind of stuff. But the problem with that then means that that two week job that was probably never going to be two weeks in the first place has now drastically expanded into a months long job because the about half the roof has to be redecked. The entire roof needs to be resurfaced then after they do that. Um, the, the majority of the, the structural beams in the walls have to, have to be replaced. Then they have to drywall, uh, redo the ceiling. The ceiling obviously has to be completely redone. Um, you know, brand new electric, all the electrics got it out. Um, plumbing has to be fixed. Like there's so many things. Um, so our, our club is now looking for a brand new uh, location because we simply cannot be shut down for several months while we wait for things and um, you know obviously uh, as as a business owner my biggest concern is that I'm going to be back down to you know the handful of loyal students that actually like to stick around or or not at all I mean it, it's essentially going to be starting over now granted I still have all my equipment that wasn't stolen. Um, so it's not like we're starting from, from an absolute zero. Uh, and the, the, the money that people have donated has allowed us to replace the damaged mats. And there seems to be just enough in there to uh, replace at least the more important weights, maybe not all of the weights, but the, the you know, the, the plates, um, and, and some dumbbells. I'm really less worried about some of the odd kilo plates and stuff. Those were, you know, Craigslist items that I found, um, you know, that, that are, are a little bit less important. I mean, they're, they're useful, but because we do most things in, in Imperial on our platform, uh, the kilo plates don't make as much of, a, uh, of an impact. Uh, so I'm not in a race to replace those. But the fact is, that it keeps getting worse. It keeps getting more expensive. And on top of that, and this is the thing that mostly I've been talking just with, uh, you know, the HEMA guys that, that we room with and with my, my wife about, but, um, you know, uh, my wife and I rent the house that we live in, the one that I'm standing in right now. And because the market is insane here right now, our landlord wants to sell the house, which means we have to look for a new home on top of all of this. And she decided that she wanted to sell right around the time that the fire happened. 
And so we've been looking for several months, but the problem is between looking for a new business location and looking for a new house, the market is insane right now. So let me explain something if you're not uh, local to Phoenix. The, the, the lockdowns and, uh, and the pandemic and the, the, the supply chains drying up, all that stuff has impacted the market big time, big time. But it's not just that. So uh, Phoenix is growing extremely rapidly. When my wife and I moved here back in 2009, um, there were just about 2 million people in the Metro Valley area, not even Phoenix proper, but in the, the Metro Valley area. And there's something like 6 million now. I mean, like in 10 years, the valley has tripled in size. And the realtor that we're talking to is actually said um, the figure that she gave us was there's something like 1800 people a week moving into Phoenix now she said Phoenix I don't know if she means Phoenix Metro Valley or if she means Phoenix proper but either way 1800 people a week right you know if you do the math out on on that per year if that number is fairly stable it's like a hundred thousand people a year that's that's a lot and uh, the HEMA guys, their real estate guy, basically said he's never seen the, the real estate supply so low. Um, so the demand is outstripping the supply at this point. And so because of that, um, $100,000 homes are now going for $300,000, right? The, the market is absolutely insane right now. And both our club and, you know, our personal life, we are getting priced out of Central Phoenix really, really, really fast. And uh, that's that's a problematic thing. And the, the reason that's problematic, other than the fact that it means that we have to move and all that, is the, like, the biggest reason it's problematic for me is that since I crashed my motorcycle in 2012, I have not had a vehicle. I have not had my own vehicle. Uh, Elizabeth and I have shared a single vehicle since then. Um, and that's worked out okay because we've always lived close to wherever, you know, when I was still working in the, the regular, you know, uh, the reg regular job market. And, and then when I had my school, I have, we've always lived close enough where I could walk or ride my bicycle. And now we're talking about not only is the gym going to move, who knows where. I also have to move, who knows where which means that now I also have to spend money on a vehicle. And because of prices, well, guess what? The car market is ridiculous as well. And what, what I really need, as, especially as a gym owner, what I really need is a truck. And trucks are just about the most expensive thing on the market right now. Um, now, Elizabeth thinks she may have possibly a hookup for a truck later in the future, uh, a friend selling hers, whatever. Maybe we'll see if that happens. Um, but in the meantime, I'm looking for, you know, a, a vehicle and being in Phoenix, the thing that makes the most sense for the price point that I can afford is another motorcycle. And Elizabeth's not excited about that because I got into a wreck with one. I was not the one at fault, but I got into a wreck with one before and I haven't ridden in nine years. And that's fine, but I, you know, and I always intended on getting another bike, but I, I just never got around to it. And now we're talking about it again. And, you know, it, it's just always one thing after another. And I tell you what, right? I'm, I'm not excited about the prospect of potentially having to buy a new motorcycle. I mean, I love motorcycles. They're cool. Uh, they're gorgeous machines, they're toys, they're auxiliary vehicles. You do not want to have a motorcycle as your daily transportation. As daily transportation, they are miserable. Uh, with such limited cargo space, being exposed to the elements, um, with the safety gear that you really do need to wear and, and, and purchase and maintain, um, they're not near as, as convenient as they look on, on the front. Um, like I said, motorcycles should always be a toy. 
they should not be a primary mode of transportation. But the problem is with the housing market pushing us out and the car market making vehicles extremely difficult to come by, especially ones that aren't going to just break down on you and give you, you know, $300 a month in repair bills. Um, looks like a motorcycle might be where I'm headed. And that's in any other situation, I'd be like, yay, motorcycle. And right now I'm sitting here going, fuck, really? Again? Because when we moved down here, motorcycle was my only form of transportation. From 2009 to 2012, that was how I got around because Elizabeth needed the car to drive to work. She's always worked farther away from home than I have. And it made more sense for her to be able to use the car, let me drive the motorcycle. And I tell you what, is motorcycles are fun, but man, miserable for, for daily commuting. So I don't know, um, we'll see what happens. I just needed to say stuff out loud. And the fact is that, you know, while this channel has essentially no subscribers, it's the perfect time to do it because now this is just for me and nobody's gonna look at the backlog of videos. So anyway, I think that's enough. I will talk to you guys later. Good journey.